field and the sector, arts and education professionals were determined to find ways to continue their work despite the, uh, uh, the problems we're facing by using, especially using digital technology, either on a temporary basis or long-term. And um, so now here we are eight, eight months into the pandemic and we're still in a, a precarious uh, position, uh, but uh, things are different as well. There are, I, I think for one thing, we've all become immersed in this pandemic experience and we've tried to make things work in our own ways. And um, so uh, it seems like a good time to check in with you. Uh, we're still uncertain what the future holds, but you folks now have actually a lot of experience in dealing with these uh, conditions. And so today we're inviting you to um, uh, share with us and with one another, very much, very important, uh, share with one another to help and, and we'll try, together we'll try to chart a course for the sector into the future, despite all the uncertainties we face. So that's where we are or where our headspace is in, 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 in setting this up. And, and so, um, yeah, I think that uh, I just, I'm just really grateful to you that, that you're participating. Um, and so I'll pass it over to Jennifer, who's going to um, do some housekeeping items. And also she's going to, get you all to say a little tiny bit about uh, who you are and, 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 and how you're coming into this uh, situation. Okay, so thank you very much. And Jennifer, to you. Thanks very much, Larry. So by now, I'm sure most everyone is very familiar with Zoom, likely been using it a lot. Uh, probably don't need to go through too much, but um, just a reminder, if you're not speaking, try to keep yourself muted to eliminate kind of background noise. Um, and actually, since the last time I've used mute or used Zoom, things have changed a little bit because as we go through the the conversation, we've had people kind of virtually raise their hands, um, and now I'm not even seeing that as an option anymore. Maybe someone I see a thumbs up and I see a clapping, but uh, uh, I don't see the hand raising option anymore on here. I don't know if anyone. But anyways, as we go through, you can just wave us down or you can give a thumbs up and uh, and we'll know to uh, to call on you within the uh, the conversation. Um, there you go. Somebody raised their hand. I don't know how you did that, but uh, it is possible. Apparently, maybe I can't see it from my end. OK, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, it's underneath your participants um, menu. Yeah. Lower left hand corner. I don't appear to have it, but anyways, hopefully the rest of you do. So that's good. Maybe because I'm already going to be speaking. I don't have that option. I don't know. Um, <laughs> right. um, so, um, but, oh, there was one thing. Anyways, yes. So participants tab, you can see who's here. Chat. Um, we encourage you to use that if you, uh, if someone's talking and you want to comment and uh, not speak, uh, please do go ahead. You can also privately message somebody, or you can send a message to everyone. I'm sure you're all very familiar with all of this. Um, so we are going to get going. Oh, yes. And if you do not want to take part in the conversation, you just want to listen in, just uh, leave your video off and uh, I will not uh, call on you. So very excited to get started here. I'm just going to go through the list and one by one, if you can say uh, your name, uh, the work that you do, uh, if you're with an organization or, or on your own, and um, just a, a sentence about uh, where you are in your current practice and, and uh, what you're currently uh, dealing with, just a sentence or two, and we'll of course get more into it as the conversation goes along. So we'll start with Ariana. And you will have to unmute yourself and remute. Uh, hi, okay. I'm I'm with the Canadian Music Competition, and sorry, I don't have um any other. Sure, Canadian Music Competition. All right, great. All right, thank you, um, Barbara. Hi, I'm Barbara. Um, I'm an independent art instructor, visual arts. And I just launched um, online art classes. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> great, great. Uh, Chelsea. Oh, hi, everybody. 
Um, I'm Chelsea and I'm with the Cinematech in Vancouver. Uh, we've been running online mostly uh, filmmaking and media literacy courses. So it's been a lot of like me on a floating Zoom screen at the front of like live classrooms, which is interesting. Um, and right now just trying to adjust to the ever changing situation as we all are. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, uh, so do, 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 Crystal. Oh, you're muted there. Got it. There we go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Crystal. I'm a theory and your training teacher. I'm a registered music teacher in Victoria, BC, and I'm teaching exclusively on Zoom and uh, quite enjoying it, but with technical mm -hmm. issues, of course, as everyone else faces. Great. Thank you. Um, apologies if I don't say this correctly. Damaris. Yeah, you got it. Oh, great. Um, it's more simple than people think. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a dance teacher and dancer. Um, and right now I'm teaching with a private studio. And sometimes I teach through the school systems um, or after school programs. But those are um, the after school program is not happening for me right now. And the school programs, well, I, I applied for an art starts grant. So for the spring, we'll see what happens if that's online or not. And I'm doing a lot of professional development from my home. Great. Um, Della. Hi. Hi. Am I muted or unmuted? Nope. We can hear you. Oh, now yeah. you're muted. There okay. you go. Okay. Uh, my name is Della Burford. I live in Vancouver Island, and I'm a, an artist, storyteller, and writer. I create my own books. Um, I'm uh, just beginning to think about doing more work online. Obviously, it seems to be the way to be going. So I'm looking for ideas and watching people that are doing it and figuring out how I can do it, and, um, and that's where I'm at. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Heidi. Hi, yes, I'm Heidi Bergstrom. I'm in uh, Victoria, actually in The Chosen, which is just outside Victoria. I'm here with two hats on. One is with Exchanges Artist Gallery and Studios. Um, we're an artist-run center, run studios, uh, exhibitions, all kinds of different things. What we've recently had to do those put all of our life drawing online that's been a big challenge uh, we started that back in may and it's been um i can only describe it as transformational to the organization as a whole um every aspect of exchanges has been positively impacted actually there's been a lot of challenges but in the, at the end of the day it's been a really positive experience um and just broken us out of some really old behaviors and, and modes of thinking and being that we didn't expect. And the second hat is um, in my own studio practice here, I run an international artist uh, residency. That's been really interesting, um, making things COVID safe for individual artists to come here and practice in my studio and to work with me and how we can collaborate in spite of all of the um, constraints and challenges that we face. So yeah, so it's been a very interesting experience. I have a lot of experience online before all of this um, in my career. So going online wasn't a big leap for me, but it's been more of a change management process of helping others along and going digital. So that's where I'm at. Great. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Um, Joan. Hi everyone, um, I am the Executive Director of Place des Arts in Coquitlam, and we are primarily an arts education center. And right now uh, we are offering a combination of in-person um, and online, and also hybrid where you have um, in-person as well as online students joining in, which has been a new challenge for us, but it seems to be working. Um, Right now, uh, I may have to come in and out of the meeting because the uh, health order just changed um, 
was updated and uh, we were, it, it initially stated that we could resume in-person dance while the guidelines were being updated, but now it states that we have to <laughs> suspend them. Uh, so I, w there's a, like a ton of communication that we're doing and constantly monitoring our safety protocols, making sure that teachers are trained. We have our private studio music studio set up so that a teacher can take um, an in-person student and then an online student. And we have a five minute break in between for disinfecting and cleaning and such. So we are learning a lot. Um, it's very restricted, but we're, we're managing. Great, thank you, Joan. Um, Judith. <clears throat> I, I believe I'm an outlier here because uh, I'm uh, from Ontario. Hi, Larry. <laughs> Lovely to see you. It's been a number of years. Um, and I am part of uh, CODE, the Council of Ontario uh, uh, Drama and Dance uh, Educators. It's the subject association in Ontario. And I uh, am was a, a past president a number of years back, a few decades ago now. However, um, I am on a, an advocacy committee and I was asked to check this out, partly Larry and partly just to, sort of to find out how we can make connections and um, anyhow, all I can say, I feel privileged to be with a whole lot of Westerners. So great, I'll just probably be the fly on the wall to find out more about it if that's okay. Great, yes, welcome. Um, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the audience services manager for the Vancouver International Children's Festival. Uh, this is my second festival with uh, Kids Fest. And um, last year, we were lucky enough to be able to produce basically television shows uh, in a closed environment that was safe for our artists and technicians, and then put it out online. And uh, we have a similar plan for next year. Uh, and we do hope to have some live events um, at a venue uh, interior. Uh, for those of you who know Vancouver on Granville Island, Performance Works. And we also hope to be able to do something uh, outside on the um, hill right beside that space. But as, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember, uh, maybe it was Judith uh, or Joanne, uh, who had just spoken about being in Coquitlam, uh, the things are changing. So we're uh, seven months out from our event. So we're very much in, let's hope that we can do this mode and we'll see what actually happens with our live events. But either way, we will be going forward with something and we're all excited to hear uh, what the rest of our community is doing. Excellent, thanks, Kelly. Um, Kevin. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Kevin Ellis. I'm the director of education at the Arts Club Theatre Company. Um, and, uh, you know, in March, we had to transition almost all of our programming online uh, and have been there ever since. We haven't left the online platform, at least for education. Um, and of course, with the theaters, the theaters itself, um, as some of you here can attest to, uh, particularly, um, at least I can speak for folks from BC, uh, we've just recently had to shutter all of our theaters once again, um, and are, you know, looking at other opportunities right now, um, digital opportunities to see how we can engage our audiences still. So it's great to be here. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Lauren. Hey, I'm uh, Lauren. I'm the creative director at Ptarmigan Arts on Pender Island, BC. Um, and uh, we do workshops and classes um, in different art forms for our community and the island communities here. So we've had to, um, we've done a mix of continuing some in-person um, programs with very um, restricted uh, guidelines and um, also moving to some online structures as well, just trying to be sensitive to the needs of the community and also doing more of a focus on arts for wellness, uh, especially to try and um, combat mental health challenges in our community. Uh, we have a lot of older folks here and more vulnerable populations. Um, and yeah, I feel like we were just kind of getting into a rhythm and then things changed again. So it's always that constant reevaluation 
and figuring out how to move forward with all of our different different programs in different um, art forms and mediums. So, great, thanks, Lauren. Um, Marilyn. Where is Marilyn? Oh, sorry, Marilyn, you're muted. I'm going to try to unmute you here. One moment. There we go. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. Try again. There we go. My bad. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, okay. I'm still I'm still getting used to being called Marilyn because I've been called Marnie most of my life. But oh, ICBC, sorry. ICBC did not. Yeah, oh. drivers decided that my name was Marilyn because that's what's on my birth certificate. So I was like, okay. So <laughs> anyways, that's where I said. Um, I am a voice teacher um, slash music teacher, as I'm sure, and I recognize some faces here in the music, uh, those who are at the conservatory in Victoria. Um, all of us, I think, are working online now. Um, I'm beginning to think that maybe I should just go out and get a diploma in um, to be a recording engineer because I have so much deep appreciation for them now, especially in cable management. Uh, so that's where I'm at um, as I'm also a choral conductor and uh, that is still, we have two left outside. We've become like the post, the postman or post, post people where through Sleet or Hale, we, uh, we have that, we have that rehearsal and it's almost more of a socially distanced hula hoops, the whole shebang, been through so much cleaning. Tried with, um, all my voice students are online and they've also become very adept at um, finding, buying the, the proper equipment. And so it literally sounds like we're in a recording studio together, which has been fantastic and no latency. Um, I agree with, and I apologize, I think it was Heidi who said there's some transformational things that have happened in a, in a very positive way. And I think there have been some things that has force people to break out of some of the ways that things have always been done. And finally, I also uh, have taught music together for families. I put my own children through that. It's an international, um, international company on music education. And they were one of the first ones that were on top of um, changing it to be an online platform. But unfortunately, because it deals with families that bring newborns right through to five-year-olds, the families don't want anything to do with online and I don't blame them. They, they have managed it. So it's 20 minutes they have a format because they know that about screen time, but the parents don't want to, don't want to do it. And I want to say, I'm really thrilled to be here because I've heard about it for years. My, um, my mother's husband, who's very dear to my heart. He's, he's like a stepdad to me is on the board, Douglas risk. I don't know if, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, he's been talking to me about it for years. They've just recently moved close, close to me. And I just love the fact of all the arts because we're all, you know, like they say, we're tired of hearing it, but we're all in it together. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's where I'm at. Great. Thank you, Marnie. Yeah. Good to hear that connection. Um, Mary Elizabeth. Yes, good morning everyone, or afternoon, I guess, in Ontario. Um, I'm a retired professor from uh, the dance department at York University, and um, I've, um, I'm kind of tuning in because I'm, I've been very interested uh, over the years, of course, in dance education, and uh, I keep in touch with a lot of my former students who are involved in dance education in some way or other, either in um, studios or in the education um, settings, uh, elementary or secondary or post-secondary. Uh, and um, I guess uh, the other thing too is that I'm uh, involved with the Dance and the Child International Organization, which is um, facing a really um, kind of traumatic situation because we had planned to have an international um, meeting uh, conference at York um, in 2021. And we had to postpone that to 2022. And now the board is um, trying to decide if in fact we should just uh, cancel the, <clears throat> um, the conference and do an online kind of conference instead. So we're having a discussion about that um, in a week's time and we'll have to make a decision about that. So I guess um, I'm, I'm just interested in the whole field of 
um, arts education and uh, and then also hearing from teachers uh, and and how they are operating now with um, our new situation um, being primarily online. So mm -hmm. great, thank you, um, Phoenix. Hello everyone, um, I'm Phoenix. I'm Director of Voice of Purpose. Um, I've been in community arts education uh, as an artist educator for the past 15 years. Um, and currently we are uh, doing a research project that looks at um, the engagement of artists and the needs of, the needs of artists um, when engaging in digital learning environments. And this is a project that was funded through the Canada Council. Um, and I have several partners on board, um, such as Art Starts, Gem Blaze, uh, uh, Roy Thompson, TO Live, uh, Harbor Front, or no, not Harbor Front officially, um, Peony. There's several, Neighborhood Arts Network, there's several of us at the table. And um, right now we are in phase one, stage one, where we are developing partnerships with arts organizations and artist educators and leaders in the industry to help us uh, get the word out about this research project um, and also be partners on it, meaning that, you know, be either the partic participants and also receive kind of all of the research findings that we gather at the end, because we do want to share this as a large resource for um, the larger ecosystem of community arts in helping us to make this transition. There's a huge gap of literacy in our, in our sector. Um, and especially independent artists uh, are kind of uh, at that place where needing greater access to professional development. And that's kind of the corner of uh, the space that we take up at Voice of Purpose specifically. Um, so any folks who are interested in, in connecting around that, I would welcome you to message me. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of here to see who else is kind of doing awesome work and, and wanting to connect to larger networks so that we can all benefit the work that we're doing together and just do resource sharing and, you know, just uh, as a collective help lift the, the digital literacy of, of folks who are doing really good work. And the last thing I'll say is like the specific pocket that I take up is really focusing on uh, using the arts as a way to engage in understanding of social issues and exploring uh, dialogues around identity and purpose and well-being and healing. And so if those kind of intersect with some of your work, um, please hit me up. And also just a heads up, I've signed up for all of the conversations. So <laughs> I hope that's not obnoxious, but we are, the, the, the project is funded to span Canada and the US. So we're going across the whole continent. So anyway, don't want to take up too much time. Thank you so much for having me. That's great. Welcome. And of course, we're as the network, we're interested in hearing more about your research and can certainly help uh, spread that along as as it progresses. Um, Ruth. Hi, I'm Ruth McIntosh. My pronouns are she and her. I work at Gateway Theatre. I'm the education manager and Gateway Theatre is situated on uh, the traditional territories of the Hunkaminam speaking peoples, which is uh, Richmond known colonial. Lee, uh, which is a suburb to, to Vancouver. And uh, currently uh, I, I run an ac academy um, of classes. And whereas I offered both online and in-person experiences this fall, uh, really it was our in-person classes that ran um, our on with obviously res um, restrictions attached. Um, our one in-person or online class that ran is uh, called Creating a New Spaces. And it leans into uh, uh, facilitating participants um, into learning how to generate or what is performance on a virtual platform. Um, and it's led by Veronique West and it's a, an, a young adult program. Students are between the ages of 18 and 24. And that's just got started. So I don't know how it's going yet. We have class number two tomorrow. Um, but I'm really excited about it because it, it was important for me to lean into the fact that this is what we're in. And so how do we, how do we benefit from that? What can we generate from that? Great. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Sandra. Hi, I'm from Victoria. I direct a children's choir, um, James Bay Children's Choir, and um, it's a, an affordable option for kids 
mostly in the community and we have about 20 kids between the ages of 6 and 13. So because of several immunocompromised children, we've been online since April. And after the summer break with me taking all kinds of um, professional development free options, I um, it started up again in September. Um, we lost a few kids because of the online experience, but we've gained some new ones. And one of the really exciting things we did this past week, and we hope to do again in the new year, is we had a visit from one of the composers of a song that we're working on uh, from Kingston, Ontario, Mark Surrett. And he came in, he joined us, and the kids were thrilled. So we are working on a few other songs of uh, composed by live composers, and we hope to be able to invite them to our rehearsals. And besides that, I teach piano and, and voice and theory, and that is also mostly online for me. Great, thanks, Sandra. Um, Yannick. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Yannick. I'm the uh, program director at the Canadian Music Competition. Um, so just like Phoenix, uh, we, we registered for our discussion across Canada because uh, we have 13 chapters uh, across Canada, so we are trying to see what's going on in every um, area of Canada so we can adjust our activities. Uh, we usually have a national edition that spans uh, across all Canada in 13, um, 13 cities, and we try to maintain the in-person aspect of the national edition, um, and we're trying to have a hybrid sort of way to do, to do that. So we would have people in the hall and some people um, uh, from a distance and we try to see in each province is what is the best so we, I think we will mostly be listening to you because you really have the insight. Um, Ariana and I are working on that and we are from Montreal so we are also an outsider <laughs> just like um, who said was an outsider from Toronto I think it was uh, Judith exactly yes <laughs> so yeah so we'll be mostly listening and see uh, how you guys uh, can adjust your activities. So thank you very much for having us and thank you for having uh, those round tables. I think it will be very interesting. Great, thank you. Um, and Judith Marcuse, we missed you the first time around. Hi everyone, sorry for my late appearance. We're, uh, we're experiencing high winds out here near Horseshoe Bay uh, and we lost power three times. So hopefully it'll stay on for the rest of this uh, gathering. Um, delighted to be with you. Um, just to uh, uh, say very briefly, um, uh, talk about our current projects. Um, we're running a national mentorship program in community engaged art for social change. Uh, it's been going for a year and some 50 artists, both mentors and mentees will have been through the program um, by the late spring. Um, this is a program where both the uh, artists are compensated for their work and it's supported by the McConnell Foundation. And so far it's been an extraordinary experience in as much as um, the energy and passion and uh, expertise and creativity and innovation of people in the program has, has been extraordinary. Very, very energizing for, for everyone. And at the same time providing um, mutual support for people, artists who are often working in isolation from each other. So we have participants from Nunavut and Northwest Territories to Halifax to Vancouver Island. So um, just to say that we're hoping to uh, continue the program uh, past the spring, past, past the end of March, and like everyone else struggling, uh, even after we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year at, at uh, JMP and uh, ICASC, uh, International Center of Art for Social Change. Um, I do recommend if people are interested in um, the idea of mentorship, connecting senior artists with mid-career, early to mid-career um, artists who are doing community engaged uh, arts practices, um, to have a look at our website, which has a plethora of resources, many of them based on the six year research project that we did on the field in Canada. We're also involved uh, uh, to uh, some large extent in advocacy for the sector. Um, and we're developing a national network of ASC organizations, um, including Jumblies, which I heard someone mention. Um, and um, uh, just delighted that we're able to connect this way. We had to adapt our mentorship program to entirely online 
um, uh, methods. And it, it's been um, very, very interesting. And as much as um, there, we found great advantages to working online, especially as it's a national program to have national exchange uh, very easily. Um, and at the same time, we all know how embodied our work is and how difficult it is um, to, to do some of those adaptations. But we have found new software that works really well for, a, for example, for creating music together. Um, and so uh, we're just in the process of posting some of the results of, of the mentorships. Our, our last cohort was working exclusively in partnership with environmental organizations. So the mentor and the mentee were embedded with the environmental organizations and the projects were designed to serve those organizations' agendas. Um, the next iteration of the program will not be like that. I'm sorry, I'm talking so much. And so I'll, I'll shut up now. Oh, that's okay. That's great. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, wow, such a great cross section of artistic disciplines and uh, and organizations and individuals. Really excited to have everyone here. Larry, I will pass it over to you for our first kind of second question, really. You're right. You're right, Jennifer. Thank you, everybody. You asked. You answered my first question. So that that uh, saves us some time for other questions. My first question really was about uh, what you're doing and, um, and, 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 and uh, how you're using online technology. So let's move forward to question two, which is actually, and Judith, you, I think you mentioned it and I think somebody else mentioned it, the idea that there are very interesting now um, uh, technology uh, platforms that people are finding. I mean, we all, we all know Zoom, but people are finding other platforms as well. And, and so that's a good thing to be sharing right now. Um, and by the way, I wanted just to say that everything that we learn through these um, roundtables it goes onto our web, our web uh, site. Uh, um, Caitlin has created a very uh, impressive uh, set of uh, resources that you can find, especially related to uh, working online. And we're uh, we yeah we're we're also trying to find out uh, what are the best uh, platforms or most useful ones in certain instances. So what if I just asked you uh, for examples of good, good platforms or useful platforms, useful for certain things uh, that, uh, that have come your way uh, that you've tried or you, you've heard about, um, that might be a good place to start with the platforms. Yes, Marnie. Hi, um, what I found actually is um, to use platforms in together, so to layer them up. So mm. for example, I was using Zoom. I had an account for quite a long time with Zoom, but Zoom does not work well for musicians because as soon as the, especially with voice students, because as soon as they start to sing and you play the piano at the same time, the, you know, it, one cancels out the other. So I uh, had to find programs that had no latency issues. Um, so for that, Jam Kazam, which is free, and I'm actually rehearsing for a concert, a live stream concert that's going to happen on uh, December 16th, noon hour concert with two other musicians. And it works really well. The only thing, it does crash a lot. Don't let that panic you. Um, but they're, they're getting better and better at it and you get faster and faster getting back onto it. Plus, um, we've also figured out, we always want to rehearse for an hour and a half and it seems like an hour 20, everything just crashes. So there's some kind of timeline for that. But what I find particularly good about Zoom, and I don't need to pay for an account anymore because it doesn't take 40 minutes, that's as long as you have with Zoom, is that it's a fantastic thing to be able to share information. So one of the most frustrating things about being online is that the student, and I find, not surprisingly, that anyone who's you know, 50 plus has more of a difficult time than those, I have a 14 year old who was teaching me stuff. It was fantastic because he just, you know, he already had the auto interface and he already had all that stuff. But what's great about Zoom is I can see their screen. So then if I can see their screen, I can help them and walk through it. And then we also use the phone, you know, so that we get off the phone, we get off Zoom, we stabilize. Now you do have to have an ethernet cable, you do have to invest in um, audio interface and a mic, but compared to what it used to cost, it's peanuts. It's peanuts for um, 
uh, you can get some really useful things that way. So I found Jan Kazam. There's also voicelessons.com for those who uh, teach uh, in music. Um, it's It was kind of goofy, I, I have to admit. It was kind of great for, because it would have things like it would rate you would have the, the student rate you afterwards. And it's like, okay, I'm too long in the tooth to be rated after every lesson. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would just say to them, can you just put a five so I can stay on this? So they're like, oh yeah, I really like what you're doing. But it's also a very young platform. So I'm noticing that in terms of just like your cell phone company, for those of you who've ever had the experience of moving to different carriers, I have um, mostly young adult children at this point, and I know when I switched to Virgin Mobile, I was laughing because it's it's so obviously geared towards those that are 30 and under. You know, they're like, hey, nice to see you. You know, I've got some tickets for you for the show of someone I've never heard of before. So it's it's that same sort of thing with platforms, I find, is that there's just like businesses have a particular culture, so do platforms. So you have to find one to match your particular student. And I'll stop talking. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I know the latency issue was a huge issue for people at the beginning. Um, and we're hearing about a number of different uh, programs that are up and coming, such as Jack Trip. I know there's a few other programs that are happening. Um, so yeah, interested to hear if anyone else, how other people have dealt with the latency issue. Uh, you know, for choir rehearsals and and uh, and things like that. Anyone else want to share? You can wave your hand too if you can. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Jennifer. I also wanted just to throw in that um, we're not going to lose your comments here. When you suggest something about a, if you give us the name of the platform, Caitlin is putting it up as you speak. I mean, she's basically keeping it, keeping us informed. But also, we're recording this session, and we'll have a member of our research team, which we have uh, amazing <laughs> uh, graduate students who are gonna go through it and find the, uh, you know, the collective points that, that you're making. And, uh, and, and this goes into a report that we post and use. So we're not gonna lose what you say. It's, it's, yes, it's important to share, but it's also important to remember what you shared about. Okay, yeah. uh, 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 anyone else uh, like to tell us about a platform? I mean, um, I'm not sure how long we spend on this business mm -hmm. of platforms because um, maybe some of you are always using or may, are using some of the platforms that we've already mentioned. But uh, let just let us know. Um, we'll still make make it available a few minutes to talk about that. Yeah, if anyone has a, a project that went really well, kind of a best practice idea for for other people. Um, yes, Barbara. Um, so because I'm teaching visual arts, I, uh, I've been using Zoom because I've had the opportunity there to use two cameras, which has been really helpful because I can have um, the camera on me doing demonstrations and then a camera on a canvas so that I can actually get close to what actually I'm doing on the canvas. So that's been really helpful. Um, I also am able with Zoom to integrate, you know, slip, switching over to a slideshow that sort of has like some instructions and some examples that are visual separate from um, what I'm demonstrating. And uh, in the next class, I'm going to be setting up a still life that they can work from if they can't set up their own still life. And I'm just kind of trying to experiment and balance how much to ask of the student, whether they should be setting up their own still life and how they can do that, or whether, you know, because of the 2D, 3D difference of working from something flat and working from something from life. So there's some interesting challenges. And I think the biggest challenge I'm still trying to sort out with uh, Zoom is how to look at what they're working on without them just like holding it up in front of their camera and, and again what kind of burden I put on them to be able to give me a visual like I need to give them feedback but um, I'm finding zoom to be really good and I'm using Dropbox and share with that as a place to put up the class that's recorded so they can review it again after and also um, to share images that I want them to work from so I'm working with mostly uh, zoom and Dropbox right now I just got started so that's what, how I've started Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think Heidi was uh, saying yes first and then changed a hand. Oh, yeah. Hi, yeah, just for one second on Zoom. So one of the things that we've learned with our online life drawing and we're doing hybrid sessions as well, 
starting in September where we had a limited amount of artists in the gallery who were able to do in-person life drawing and we zoomed in the online folks. Um, very early on though, we learned that, you know, our models were able to also dial into Zoom with their phone. So they had two camera displays. And in fact, I did some experimentation in my studio where I had three camera displays. So I think to your point around, you know, how do you share content? It's not just about sharing, you know, your, your Chrome window or whatever, but if you also check your email on your phones and the phone quality is far superior to your laptop, we're talking HD, like my Samsung has three lenses on it. It is amazing quality. Mm. So in fact, um, the artists who were participating in the life drawing, for example, you know, we we're all looking at the same view through the laptop. Well, suddenly with the phones being involved, we've got different angles because the models could, you know, put them on a, on a phone holder and clamp it into a different area of the space. And in fact, perspective, you know, for the visual artists out there, you'll appreciate this, that, you know, foreshortening and, and things like this playing with the screen, really important, right? Um, so in fact, we were able to get more perspectives online than had we been standing at our easels in the gallery because we'd be locked on that one space. So it was kind of ironic and kind of funny because mm. the, uh, the people in the gallery were all pointing their fingers at us saying poo poo online, you know, it's a um, inferior experience. This is one of the discriminations that we were subject to regularly as being online participants. And I was, I've been fighting it for months, um, trying to change this perception and this attitude. It's very difficult. Um, whereas, you know, it was really opening it up for people online, as well as people who couldn't participate anyway, because they couldn't get up our two flights of stairs. They had economic barriers. They had mental health barriers, all kinds of things that suddenly they were able to participate. So when I was talking earlier about the transformation and the change management, that's what I'm talking about. It's it's really um, quite big. But from a technical perspective, start thinking about zooming in your cameras and other webcams. You know, so that's the other thing we did. We invested a hundred bucks in a webcam that had uh, has a wide angle perspective. So mm. it changes things up, and the technology is affordable. It's not so complicated. And and I agree with somebody else who said, you know, the 50 plus set are challenged sometimes technically, true enough, but um, with Zoom, it is a lot easier to walk people through online if you can just get them in. <laughs> so anyway, I'll stop chatting now. Great, thanks so much, Heidi. Uh, yes, Phoenix. So um, I've consulted with a couple of artists who were running their programs online, one theater artist um, who was working with monologues and another artist that I'm working with currently who uh, engages with Brazilian Zoom dance. Um, and uh, early findings are kind of coming in where we're like, okay, so one of the things that people are not taking into consideration as artists who are used to working in the analog world is that there, um, the, there's a real important um, piece around having a virtual assistant that you may not necessarily clock in. Um, in the beginning, because we're used to having program managers, we're used to having, you know, um, we go into the classroom and we have someone from the organization or from the place to kind of facilitate for a lot of the communications with participants. But when you're on your own and you're on the online um, forum, you need someone to be able to check the chat, someone who's going to send reminders to set up the automated reminders to handle the technology behind the scenes so that if you have slides going on or if you have, you know, chat, if you're um, broadcasting to multiple platforms and you're broadcasting YouTube and you're trying to broadcast to Facebook and do it on Zoom all at the same time that requires somebody with the integration technology and the know-how to be able to support you behind the scenes. Now we can keep it simple and just do Zoom and do it independently, but even when you're doing it independently, there's a lot of logistical pieces behind the scenes to have that assistant piece um, put in, even if you're spending like $15, $20 on a virtual assistant three to five hours a week, right? And if you're charging and able to bring in revenue through what you're teaching online, it might be something that you need to calculate in that you may run down a road, hit your head a few times and realize, okay, maybe I need help with this stuff. So mm. that's some of the learnings that um, I've come across so far. Great, thank you, Phoenix. I think next is Chelsea. Oh. Okay. Hi, yeah, we've, we've 
I've tried a lot of things and I don't know if I have any like one thing that has worked really well for us. We do a lot of Zoom and that works great. And we've also done a lot of like multi-camera setups so that um, if we're teaching a particular filmmaking technique, we'll have like one screen that's uh, the person talking and then you can demonstrate the actual camera um, and its settings on like another screen, which has been great. The biggest challenge is that we can't teach everything that we need to teach during a Zoom session. Cause normally what we'd be doing is going into schools or running workshops that would be like five whole days. And we're used to being able to support students during the whole day. Um, and our biggest challenge has been keeping that level of engagement at a distance, which is sort of not possible. So like we introduce so, so say, for example, we're, we're teaching smartphone filmmaking, so they're meant to make a film over the course of five days. We'll have one Zoom session a day, but like they can't follow along during that session. They have to like take what they've learned and then go apply it. Um, so we have to set up ways of supporting them through that process, which has been really challenging. We've tried things like Google Classroom, which was not super successful. We usually just add supplementary materials on Drive. So we'll make worksheets with like step-by-step -step instructions and like contact information and like sharing folders, um, which works fairly well, but we find that like, it's really difficult to keep that engagement when you're not present for like the whole process. So we're still sort of working on it. We've gotten better at it, um, but I'd, I'd I'd love to hear from other people who have maybe tried longer projects that like take, that usually take longer. Like it's, it's been really hard to teach kids when we'd normally be with them like 40 hours in a week and, and, and now we're with them maybe five. Um, yeah, that wasn't necessarily me like suggesting good things, just like things that we've struggled <laughs> with. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, uh, Judith. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Um, I'm hearing from across the country uh, uh, that it's really hard to retain youth uh, on the online platforms. Um, and I think that's something that we as a group might want to discuss together what strategies we have for retention of participants. Um, also hearing about access issues. Um, uh, sorry, backtracking uh, in reference to youth uh, in particular. Um, also hearing a lot about access issues, um, particularly in smaller communities, uh, and especially in the north where broadband isn't really available, and also in work with seniors if we're doing that kind of work. Um, I know one organization that is actually getting on the phone with participants to walk them through the technology. So I, I don't think we should assume technological um, uh, expertise. Uh, of course, we're, we don't. But that is another big issue that I've been hearing from other folks. Um, I guess um, one of the things that we've found incredibly useful are the breakout rooms. Um, oh, wow. We use them all the time. Um, and uh, finding that um, if there are particular exercises in the breakouts, we don't take very long in the breakouts, nor do we do reporting back, um, which often takes a lot of time if there are a lot of people on it. But we find that having five or six people together in a breakout really, really is effective for knowledge exchange and just for mutual support and creating some networking opportunities. So I, I highly recommend that. The last thing I, I would recommend is, um, I think it's what Phoenix said or somebody said about having a technical assistant um, managing your, um, your sessions because uh, it's incredibly hard as the facilitator, the educator in these situations to keep track of everything that's going on and at the same time be responsive uh, responsive, and kind of use everything that is appropriate in your toolbox in that moment. So um, we always use, um, always have a technical person who also takes uh, care of the uh, speaking list. So I, I just wanted to offer those, those uh, four observations. Great, thank you, Janet. Yeah. Um, and Marnie. Mm -hmm. I just uh, wanted to echo what uh, Judith was saying in regards to the um, breakout rooms. I'm on the BC Coral Federation. It's a huge board across BC. There's like 30 
board members, so you can imagine virtually. So we do have breakout rooms, but we also do report back, but they're very, you know, they're timed. So it's like, okay, people, you have this much time. And then um, when you, and then you have to report back. So it really does cause people to go, you know, stay stump and think and, and only speak because we only have so much time. Plus the breakout rooms also will say you have five minutes left. So no difference than, you know, flashing lights in the theater, right? Five minutes, get back in your seats. So the same thing. And then we know we report back. Um, so it's super duper helpful. The other thing I was going to say was, um, I haven't said super duper for a long time. That was fun. Um, the other thing was Phoenix. I love your idea. The technical assistant and would be more than happy to, uh, take part in that because that I find is one of the most exhausting parts is you think, do I have to make up time for the student? Because we just spent two sessions just getting them set up. Some again, super quick. They're teaching me and others it's um it's exhausting you know I, I i just sort of think holy moly they make every penny off of me today you know as far as setting setting them up um so i don't know phoenix if it sounds like that's something that you offer if there can be a link or something to um for that service because i'd much rather pay for that than say a zoom account where i can get it free for 40 minutes yeah it's not a service that we offer but it's oh, okay recommendation to all of you who are thinking about doing online programming to find one. I actually just put out a job description like two days or last week, but the application is closing tomorrow for my own virtual assistant. For gotcha. Okay. So how do you find them? Recommendation um, based off of what I've seen so far is like as a good practice for when you're trying to teach online. All right. So did you, uh, would you say you just, you just Google technical assistant and they're there? Um, well, what I did was I put together a job description and I sent it out to my network so that they send me cover letters and resumes and I do interviews okay. and I have a certain budget set aside for the hours that I need them. And it's just like any hiring right. an assistant, right? It's kind of like that, but okay. they have particular roles as it relates to supporting the virtual and technical aspects of what it means to run a program online. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, if, the, if no one is, uh, has a hand raised, I'll just say um, we, we did a while a little while ago have a um, host a webinar. Uh, Andrew Mercer uh, came on and and gave what I thought was terrific advice on how to keep people engaged online. And he's a wonder himself because he's doing all these things. He's set up with all his cameras and all his screens, and of course he's been doing it for many years. So he uh, has he has techniques for. Um, you know, allowing himself only to go a certain length of time and then he asks a question and I mean, lots of techniques. I just found it so um, revealing. So that's something that's on our website. You may want to check it out. Um, I think I'd like to move along to a question that's really interesting to me and, and, and our organization and that's the future. Um, so it's really how do, like I'm hearing, I'm hearing people who ha are in a very different place where you're like normal for, for many of you at least, is now working online. Like that's the norm. It's like, um, and so, all right, what happens after this pandemic? Finally, we all get this uh, wonderful um, uh, inoculation that's coming along, the vaccine or one of them, and, 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 and things are sort of, you know, safe again in the world, uh, whatever that is. Um, what's it going to look like? Um, what are you, what are your program, what are you, what is your teaching going to be like? What are your programming? What is your programming going to be like? What I know it's like crystal ball stuff, but we have to do this. We, I mean, we have to try to imagine what what we might be doing. We're trying to do some kind of planning. What? So, yeah. My question is, what do you see happening? At least in your own instance. But if you want to be, um, speak more broadly in terms of what you see happening in the world, um, I'd really like to hear. What you have to say about that? Mm. Great. We'll start off with uh, Della. You are muted. I'll try to unmute you here. Let's see. There you go. Yeah. Um, yes, I. I was thinking of this last question that we had, and I'm sort of there still, but. Um, I did go. I did go to the session that you that you spoke up, uh, um, 
and with the fellow who gave so many good ideas about how to even use a mic and how it is. And I'm hoping to apply some of those myself, actually, because I found them here to be really useful. Um, all these ideas are uh, fantastic. And uh, what will they mean for the future? Um, it's, it's hard to determine that, isn't it? Because we're in the midst of it right now. But I think that a lot of the things that we're learning can be applied still to people's lives. Partially, even if we say, okay, tomorrow it's gonna to change, will we? Will these things be useful? Yes, I think they will be useful. Because I, I think that for instance, myself, where I live in, on Vancouver Island in Nanaimo, it's somewhat remote. And with these tools that I'm seeing and learning, I can actually communicate with people internationally easier and conduct things possibly with international students in an easier way, which I personally really like the idea of and it's been part of my work my whole life. So I think there are things in the future that will be very, very important. I wanted to mention also in the last session, talked about breakout groups. I've, I've been participating in groups, you know, online for maybe, five years or so. And uh, the breakout groups, I think, are some of the most fantastic thing of all because you can actually talk with somebody else. You're not just seeing their face, it's sitting there, you're talking to them. And whether it's usually about half an hour in most of the groups that I do. And uh, I think that's really, really useful. And also I found, I don't know whether I should be mentioning Facebook right now here online, but I'll say that <laughs> the Facebook groups are, amazing when they're connected up to an event because when you can talk to a group of people online on facebook and they can share their being a visual artist they can share their pictures of their art and they can share the pictures of them doing a dance or their dream it, it, it's something incredible and it can go on you can click into it any time of the day it can be going on you know anyways just wanted to mention that great thank you Della. now kevin Hi. Yeah, I was going to mention, in terms of just answering the first question there, uh, in terms of moving to the future, I, I agree with what's been said already is that I think we're, I think there's opportunities here in terms of innovation that, uh, and, and getting used to working online that I think that we can use as threads for accessibility in the future, because I feel, I find that one of the biggest advantages of what we've all kind of been forced to learn in the last eight months is, um, is that it, we can reach people um, across boundaries. We can reach people, um, a, a larger sort of swath of people that you know, geographically might not be very close to you, but um, have, have similar things that they wanna discuss and analyze. And, and that creates partnerships and that creates, in, in the end, it creates, a, I think, a more wholesome sort of a community for the arts. I mean, that might be me, me getting all um, hippy dippy on this, but I do feel, and I know with, with, the, with the Arts Club, one thing that we've had to do, because everyone else has had to do it as well, is starting to really concentrate on partnerships. You know, utilizing and leveraging other people's, um, either their technical skills or their audiences that they're engaged with uh, and with yours and blending them together to come up with, um, you know, more engagement and more access. Um, of course, there are access challenges with folks that might not have the same capability of working online um, as others. So that's something that I think we all should be recognizing while we move forward. But that is that is what I feel um, in terms of what what we can take is aspects of aspects of what has worked really well, even when we're all meeting back in, in person again at some point, uh, to utilize that in our programming, because um, there's lots of different things that we can do that we don't have to do when we're all together in the same room physically. Um, I was just going to quickly mention that um, in a, uh, as an example of a partnership, um, the Arts Club and Bart, Bart on the Beach uh, did a session in um, every Thursday in October called Beyond the Box, and it was exactly uh, about working online um, in, in artistic environments. It was most specifically to theater, um, but there was aspects of, uh, of uh, you know, having community parties, having showcases, you know, ice breaking games, all of those things while using Zoom primarily as the platform we kind of spoke about. And, and of course, breakout rooms uh, as well. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, um, I'm not sure how I can do this. Maybe I can shoot it to, you know, the folks here at um, the, the CNAL, but um, uh, I, I can pass off some of the resources and some of the notes that we took during that too to help out. That'd be excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Chelsea. 
Um, yeah, I also agree with everything that's been said so far and I'll echo what Kevin was saying about partnerships. We've found that we can, yeah, leverage particular audience members that some of our partners have. And then we, we've usually been in the position of applying our technical skills because we have like cameras and we've done a lot of online instruction. So usually we'll partner with somebody that has like a strong audience base. Um, and that's been really useful. Uh, we recently ran a workshop at the Polygon Gallery, which has been really fun because they have like an audience that we don't at all. And we were able to like increase our outreach. And I think we want to continue those kinds of partnerships. Um, I feel a strong desire not to let all of this learning go to waste. I'm sure that everybody has felt that like learning digital instruction and like learning all these techniques for online like survival during the pandemic has been really hard. And so I don't want to, I don't want to just like go back to normal and have these wet lessons be wasted. Um, but I'm really looking forward to it being easier. So a lot of, a, a lot of the lessons that we've learned have been about being more like systematic in our approach to instruction, because we have to write everything down and we have to make everything super clear when we're doing it at a distance. Um, and that's been really helpful. So now we have like an archive of instructional materials and worksheets and things that would normally be like more ephemeral because usually we'd just go into a workshop and we would teach and then we would go home and there wouldn't necessarily be a record at the end of it except for the films that students make, which is great. But now we have like, now we have like an archive of instructional materials that we can go back to um, and keep improving, which has been really useful. And I imagine in the future, we'll always have more of a digital component to our instruction. So even if we go into a classroom and teach for a week, the students will always be able to look at the like instructional materials in a Google Drive, or there will be like some kind of online infrastructure, even when things are allowed to be a little bit more in person. Um, which sound that's like a positive, uh, but I can't, I honestly cannot wait until we can do more things in person or at least have somebody on the ground doing something in person. The hardest part is like having no space that connects everyone because it's okay if we're like teaching a classroom and the classroom's there in person, but we're at a distance like that seems fine. It's when everybody's like all scattered that it's, it's difficult to keep that engagement. And I think it'll stay difficult. I think I've just accepted that it's just hard <laughs> um, and that you have to learn to be comfortable with it being hard and just like take the positives when they come. Uh, yeah, I don't wanna waste all this hard work is basically what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, okay, great, thanks Chelsea. Uh, Marnie. Oh, hi, I uh, totally, totally agree too. I love that about archiving. You know, you see it on paper, right? And then you look back and you go, how can you prove it? But for me, it's a bit of a non-brain, or sorry, a no-brainer in that because I commute, uh, lived in Victoria for almost uh, for almost a quarter century, and um, then moved up to Lake Cowichan. So Della, I know you know that's even more remote <laughs> than uh, than Nanaimo. Beautiful place to live. Artists kind of dream to live as far as nature and all that. But how do you make a living? So it's been great. I've also been able to reconnect with students from years ago that I say moved to the States or moved to, which has been wonderful. Plus, I love the fact that it's causing all of us to, to work together because we don't, you know, we don't have a choice. We're all trying to do, and, and I don't mean we don't have a choice. It's a positive thing. Um, and besides our household pets would never forgive us, right? If we went back to how it was. <laughs> so that's it for now. Great, thanks Marnie. Um, I think some uh, some people have talked about uh, getting students in the door and getting new students and um, and how do you get more people uh, engage with more people, which I think leads us um, into our next sec section. Um, and in the email that you were sent yesterday, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to to explore the map, Canada's map of arts and learning, and also our digital um, directory online of uh, online instruction. Did anyone have a chance to, to take a look at it? Yeah, yeah, great. Um, well, I'm just gonna hand it over to Caitlin just for a minute or two to just show us a couple of, of those things. And we'd love to, to um, get your feedback on that and see how else you're, you are um, connecting with new students and bringing new people on and, and developing your practice in that way. Caitlin. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the map and the online directory. So I'm going to share my screen with you all here. Um, 
There we go. Can folks see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, if you've checked out Canada's map of learning, wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's been online for I think almost four years now. And I mean, it's grown a lot and it's great. Um, and we're hoping to grow it some more. Uh, so basically it acts as um, a kind of directory for you to be able to see uh, what is happening kind of in your communities, maybe um, in more remote communities uh, in terms of the arts and learning sector. It kind of acts as a consolidated place where you can um, maybe go to see if you want to participate, if you want to take like dance classes, for example, or if you want to invite an artist educator into your classroom or into your community center, you can see who's in your community and who you can collaborate with. Um, any artist educator or organization that offers some kind of um, programming, workshops, uh, performances can apply to appear on the map. It's free to access and free to uh, be a part of the network. So I definitely encourage you to fill it out for yourself or your organization if you haven't done so already. Um, and uh, I'll give you, I'll show you some uh, great profiles that already exist on the map. So you can kind of see what's happening in your communities around. Oops. So, this is an artist educator in Vancouver. This is his profile. Um, so on your profile, you're able to show whether you give group lessons or private lessons and whether or not you offer services to schools. And if you do offer services to schools, you can specify exactly what those services are, be it performances, workshops. Do you offer professional development for teachers? Great. Uh, you also can show who you're partnered with in your community already. So like in this case, we have a music teacher with BCRMTA um, and you can, you can hope to show like the connections and the networks that already exist in communities. So we're like obviously showing connections and networking is what we as a network really want to do. <laughs> so um, next we have um, another example of a great profile is the Yukon Art Center. Um, in Whitehorse, they offer tons of programming, both for local schools and in the community. Uh, you also have the option of concluding a featured project if you want to kind of give uh, folks an idea of what kind of programming you do, the types of workshops that you do, you can fill out a little featured project section on your profile and, and let folks know about that. And finally, oh, oh let's go right here. Um, and it also schools can also apply if they are uh, hopeful for getting artist educators from the community into their schools, they're open to that. And it also really helps us kind of gauge the level of arts education that's happening in local schools. So in this case, we have um, a school in Burnaby, um, basically showing the types of arts programming and the investment in the arts that they have happening in their school. So they, they do take in in school performances. So maybe you're an ed artist educator who wants to go into schools. They, they do field trips, et cetera. Um, and finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, our directory of online learning. Obviously the map is great when we're actually able to like go places and see people in person, but um, the, the pandemic really highlighted the fact that we want to also highlight and make easily accessible people who are offering remote digital learning opportunities. So I cre created this uh, directory of online instruction. So anyone who's on the map who has specified that they give online instruction appears in this directory. Um, anyone who has filled out uh, a profile for themselves has a little like blue um, check mark here including indicating that they're like a verified contact by us um and yeah uh i hope it's like useful obviously you can filter to find out exactly what kind of programming you're looking for if you're looking specifically for folks who offer virtual programming for schools or virtual programming uh, for like community members whether like group classes um yeah, and also the process for applying to get into this online directory is the exact same as applying for appearing on the map. Just go to the map 
tab here on our website and then click on get on the map and you're good to go. Great, thank you, Caitlin. So uh, yeah, wondering um, on getting your feedback on, on how you feel that the map and the online directory, if they're, how they are useful tools for the public as well as for you to promote yourself and if you're on there and how, how you think they could potentially be improved. Um, any, any comments that you have? Yes, Mary Elizabeth. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that. That was really, really uh, wonderful. I, I have to say that I haven't um, uh, accessed the, the map, uh, you know, recently, but I'm, I'm thinking about, again, about the Dance and the Child International Organization, and they do have a website and they, um, they try to connect, you know, partnership um, work in various parts of the world and so forth. But I'm wondering whether there is any way to put the two, like to to put this map somehow onto the Dance and the Child International uh, website so that people could access it from there, or whether this is just an independent, um, yeah, map and and tool um, for us in Canada. Uh, well, certainly we want to. Um to make the map as accessible as possible, especially now with the online directory, um, so that anyone from around the world can work with a Canadian artist educator or a Canadian arts organization. Um, so as far as that particular um, organization, um, we could potentially, they could link to the map certainly, and they could, uh, you know, absolutely, it's it's open for everyone. So if, if they're able to, I don't think we could necessarily, we couldn't house the map on there through them, but um, they could definitely link to it and um, and make that available to their members for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, as far as ethics go, um, what what is the protocol for linking, say, um, this map uh, on our website? The Daisy website. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, Caitlin, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I, I don't see any kind of um, ethical dilemma there per se. All the information that's on the map is all publicly available information, so they would be able to find that information um, if they were just googling. Um, there's, uh, you know, all the artists who have or organizations that have contact information on the map it's all been um, authorized by them to have that information there um, we don't post anything that's that's private information at all so um, i don't i don't see that there would be any kind of issue with that i don't know caitlin if you have any additional this is another question um and again i'm not um that familiar with the the map and all the processes that um one can go through but can you um pinpoint all of those people who are doing something that is dance related uh in education or um in the you know public um sector or is that possible uh yeah yeah caitlin do you want to to talk yeah. I'll, I'll share my screen again really quickly here and show you how to filter for that on the map, actually. Um, yeah, so if you are on the, sorry, there we go. If you're on the map page itself, you can filter your search. Sorry, I, I should have gone to this originally, but you can search, filter your search by uh, dance, for example. And if you are looking for like, dance classes for yourself in the community, you can select to search for those offering community programs. Alternatively, if you're looking for someone who does dance programming for schools, uh, you can also filter that way. Um, so, this might take a minute. There we go. <clears throat> Oh, I should have specified BC, but nonetheless. Um, and yeah, and then it'll filter your results. You can um, specify or filter your results even further if you're looking maybe for an organization that 
caters specifically to folks with disabilities, or if you have a price range in mind, um, those are all options to filter your search by. So. Oh, great, thanks. Um, did that answer your questions, Mary Elizabeth? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, oh. yeah. I kind of knew that when you were showing it um, before, uh, but I, I just wanted to make sure that that was the way it was done. Thank you. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Heidi, yes. Sorry, I was muted there for a sec. Yeah, I guess my question, Caitlin, was um, I couldn't see where there's anywhere on the site that shows how many people have looked at a, um, a location. Do, is there something like that on the site? Like if I was to go to exchanges, because we've loaded exchanges on the map now, mm -hmm. to be able to see how many people have actually viewed um, exchanges page, for example, any data? No, we don't actually uh, display that readily. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, we don't. But I mean, I'm. I mean, I, I feel like we'd be able to like get that info from like our analytics that we run on our website, but it's not just posted like that it, there. Yeah, yeah. So when you log in on your profile, for example, to be able to see how much traffic has actually come from the map or or whatever, it would be helpful. That's fair. That's that's actually a really good point. Yeah. For like, yeah, I imagine as like an organization or individual for marketing purposes. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll see how like readily easily that would be to in integrate into that experience. Yeah, thank that's, you. That's a great suggestion. And uh, one thing that we are working on um, is a new interface for the map that where you don't have to go to the map and pull up this all of this data. You can just um, you can just type in what it is exactly you're looking for, and then just a list that comes up instead of the map because sometimes the map can take a while to load because there's so much information and then with this interface we can do a, a much better job of tracking uh, yeah. what has happened and also um, it can also follow up if they've asked to contact you and that type of thing so we can see what the engagement is with the map through the public etc so yeah it's really important because this is what funders and sponsors are asking for now all the time is this data the audience traffic so we participated recently in culture days and i i don't know if there was anything between um cnal and culture days at all this year but it was very successful it was the first time we ever participated it was a month long event, it pushed us really quickly to get um, certain events and things online that we hadn't really anticipated before. We, we did stuff like Zoom and Facebook Live <laughs> events. Okay, some of it was a little clunky, I'm not going to lie. It <laughs> didn't always get pulled off that well, but it did push us to do that. And um, we ended up, I'll just give you one example. So typically, you know, our artists are often emerging emerging artists, they would like to do a talk, you know, a public engagement thing. We were very limited because of COVID. So there was only three of us in the gallery, 38 people came in out online. We never would have had an audience that size in person ever. I don't think ever in the history. Wow. So it was fabulous. We recorded it. And of course, one of the limitations on our side is that it's time, right? Because we're completely volunteer run. We have a working board of directors so everything is off, you know, the side of your personal desk. And um, so we can't always get our materials online in a timely way. So Liam, for example, his artist talk uh, video has not been posted yet. However, we have posted other things and other videos. We've been able to do that. So getting that traffic information, though, is really important. We weren't able to get it from Culture Days either. And I did make the suggestion to them that getting that information and understanding the demographics more really helps um in the digital environment so yeah yeah great and do you have your own kind of analytics set up on your we website? do because our site so we migrated our old night circa 1994 website into the wordpress domain Woohoo! i actually got the domain transferred etc it took months to do actually uh long story but now we're on wordpress we actually had to integrate as well with a square online store we're on eventbrite uh, meetups across the United States, all over. We had actually through the summer, 85 American artists participating in our online uh, life drawing wow. from May to August. 
uh, who are now joining our organization as members. First time ever, we have people across Canada joining our organization as members um, in other parts of British Columbia, Vancouver, the island, whatever. Exchanges was traditionally a very Victoria-centric organization. That's all done now. No more. No more navel gazing, uh, you know, at our bellies in Victoria. Uh, it's become almost international in a way. So very interesting. That's what I mean about the whole transformative part. It's hit, hitting the organization at many, many levels. So not just technology and, and things like that, which is important, but... Um, yeah, but I find in looking at um, grant applications, for example, and sponsor relationships and even partnerships, people are asking, you know, well, who's your audience? Well, our audience is now part of CNAL. Like you're bringing audience to us. We're bringing audience to you. How is that exchange happening and what does it look like from um, a traffic perspective and demographic perspective? Because our tools can tell us that, right? How many hits are coming from, you know, Facebook? Facebook is still our number one, interestingly enough, whereas we have a lot of people on our board who are not on Facebook, but in fact, a lot of our audience is on Facebook. Anyway, all these things are interesting, you know. Sorry to prolong the conversation, but are you paying for ads on Facebook and things like that? Or I did you... one boost, okay, oh. and it was phenomenal. I did a $25 boost for Andy Liu, who did a, an online demo for contemporary Chinese brush painting. And when you look at the when you look at the graph, you know, for September, there's huge spike, three thousand, you know, um, impressions or something like that, and then it just flattens out like a, you know, a heartbeat that's gone to zero. And then once again, you know, when we're doing promotion, I, I worked for many years in advertising and marketing with Campbell Soup Company and Chorus Entertainment and doing different things. And there's a saying, you know, if nothing happens, nothing happens. And it's very true, especially online. If you're doing something and you're not telling people about it, you're not going to get people participating. And online, it's critical. It's absolutely critical, yeah, to do that. So paid advertising, Facebook is extremely uh, effective for small amounts of money, very small amounts of money. You've got really good expanded reach. So Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, Heidi. Very useful. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, Judith. Hi, lost power twice in, in the last 10 minutes, so I, I may disappear uh, again. Um, just, uh, I want to um, just uh, uh, comment on just a couple of things that have been said. Um, uh, partnerships piece um, is, I think, really, really critical. I want to offer one example, and um, uh, an organization in Halifax is partnering with food banks, and what they're doing is providing bags of art materials that go in with the food boxes and those are distributed. Did I tell you about this already? No, that was another call. Okay, um, uh, those are distributed uh, with the food boxes and um, the inside the packages are art materials, but also there's online participatory opportunities as well. So that partnership has been very, very successful and it's being emulated in other parts of the country now that people are talking to each other about what they're doing. Um, in terms of um, uh, survival and the future, um, I just want to put in a really strong bid for um, advocacy work at the federal level. Um, we know that there's going to be triage after the end of the emergency funding. <clears throat> And the information that we have right now is that um, some of the larger organizations which have access to private uh, uh, sponsorship and other sources of individual revenue um, will be um, pr probably in better shape than the more independent and um, community-based organizations across the country. We know that Heritage has just uh, changed some of its programming and the announcement was made yesterday, and that is um, something we should be looking at. But the, the new minister um, is aware of the community arts, uh, uh, um, arts learning, arts education sector. And I, I can't emphasize enough how individual letters to the minister's office have, um, have effect. So whatever advocacy you can do, um, our sector, which has been um, you know, really uh, disregarded uh, in many ways at the federal level, 
um, uh, whatever you can do in terms of advocacy uh, at, at the federal level, I think is really, really important. Um, the other, the last piece is just around evaluation and, and analytics and data. And more and more, I just want to reiterate, I think what Heidi was saying about, um, you know, gathering that data, using it, it uh, asking your participants for their, um, for their anecdotal and even quantitative, how many hours did you spend um, in this program? All of that is becoming more and more important for funders as um, things sort of shift to a more technocratic um, and less anecdotal uh, way of, um, of uh, uh, selecting um, people for funding. So just those couple of things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, <clears throat> yes, I was going to say something I forgot, but I'll hand it over to Larry right now um, and to kind of wrap things up here. Thank you, everyone, for your for your input. Yes. We will be sending a, an email tomorrow to get uh, to get your reflections on on uh, on what we discussed today and uh, and a little bit more information from you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jennifer. In order to ended a timely way. I, 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 we, we are, I am very interested in actually how you are faring, how you, how you and your clients are personally sort of emotionally able to, to cope. Um, maybe we could give like two minutes to that question because I think it's really important just to touch base on that, but then I'll end, we'll end the meeting because I know everyone has to go and to other Zoom meetings and so on. So. But I, I can I put in a little bit of a question of just how are you how are you doing personally in this all this? Uh, we'll start with Stella. Yeah. Your mute. Your mute. Uh, yeah, I I feel that um, this is really helpful to be able to see other other people that are involved in the arts and talk to them. I've been involved in. I think three or four of your sessions so far, and, and I, they've been very, very uh, wonderful for me to be able to hear what other people are doing and know there's other people in the same boat in a way, and that we're all trying to deal with it. And, and I found now, it, in fact, it's more positive now when I'm hearing people talking than it was in the beginning when we first started doing these sessions. Um, so I think that's great and wonderful. And I, I think it's great that you're doing this uh, uh, Kate and we're doing a great job on this on this chart of the map. I mean, that's a phenomenal project, and I'm glad to hear of the new interface too. I think it will be very helpful for a lot of people. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Anyone else? <clears throat> yes, Sandra. I, I just like to say that that this um, moving from in person to online lessons has really weeded out the um, well, the the less committed. So um, those who are really keen to learn have stayed with me online, and I've gained several new students who are could not get the online experience with their own teachers. So um, the, I've and the learning is unbelievable. I've had some really really positive results from teaching online. Great, great. I'm not hearing a lot. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to be able to ask that. When I asked that question, some of you who were there earlier, you know, back in the spring, I got, you know, 20 hands raised and everybody was in a pretty bad place emotionally. I mean, it was really, really tough on people, on us, on all of us. So this is an interesting, an interesting um, kind of shift that, that has been happening. So, okay, I'm going to wrap it by just saying, I'm going to echo what Judah said, which is, wow, what amazing work you're doing out there. You type that, Judith. And uh, um, it's just impressive that people, <laughs> you are carrying on and making things work. And uh, it's a testament to the human spirit that we're, we're doing this. But And uh, we will we will carry on. Some of you are going to join. You're very welcome to join again. Uh, Phoenix, wherever you are uh, on my screen. Um, anyway. Um, you're very welcome to join other other sessions. It's it's um, it's completely open. It's just um, you just have to check with the web, with the website. Um, and uh, just, so just thank you all for your input. This is 
really brilliant input and it's really much appreciated. And we will try to make it part of our responsibility to in fact in forge partnerships across the country as well mm -hmm. to help, you know, I mean, we're, we're a little tiny organization. You've met our staff, <laughs> that's us. And then, and then our, our, our board is, uh, yeah, our, our board is engaged of course as well. So, um, but we're doing what we can and this has really helped us a lot. So thank you. And thank you for sharing with one another. Yes, thank you. And I wanted to mention the thing that I was uh, forgot before is that we do actually have a list of contact information for the federal ministers on our website. So as Judith mentioned, uh, if you want to to write letters, we have also created kind of a template there that you can cut and paste into a and personalize into an, an email. So um, we will send you that and uh, some of these other links in our follow-up email uh, that you'll receive likely tomorrow. And uh, and thank you again. I'll just echo what Larry said. Thank you so much. It's been so very wonderful chatting with all of you and hearing your experiences. Yeah. And uh, and we will be posting um, the videos and also the report uh, will come out in in a few weeks time as well. So thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.